in the three civil suits. And civil suits is dramatic because if you're found guilty of antitrust litigation, triple damages. All right. right? So that that big time damages, triple damages. And so they're saying, hey, you know what? If I'd have known, I never would have offered a commission to the agent that brings in the buyer. Why would I do that? I wasn't informed. I mean, you can say you told me, but I didn't really understand that. Thanks, everyone. Uh, We are here and we're talking about a topic that everyone seems to be talking about right now. It's a topic that you folks have requested. um, And I found someone uh, that is good. It's going to be a real treat. I think you folks are going to really going to enjoy this one. Uh, this is Saul Klein. He's been in the industry for a while, right? Not just in real estate, but you know, in some of the big building blocks of the industry as we know it today. Talking about MLSs, talking about taking listings online, talking about the business, right? So Saul, uh, I met Saul through the Lab Code Agents Facebook group. He's a contributor there, always providing uh, great information, great insight. And great perspective, right? Because uh, Saul's been around the block a few times uh, when it comes to the real estate market. So I think it's going to be a real treat for everyone uh, because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, alarmism, a lot of confusion, a lot of issues around uh, these two big lawsuits that are that, that NAR is facing and, and a lot of the big brokerages are facing. But without further ado, Saul, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into real estate? Uh, you've been in the game for a while, and and what what do you do now? Like, what's your focus now? Because I see you speaking at different events, doing a lot of uh, consulting. So, uh, give folks a little bit of information. Sure. Well, it's good to be here, Gus. Good to talk to you. I've known you for a while. This is one of the beauties of the internet and the web and social media is you meet people, but you never meet them, right? You, you meet <laughs> them. As a matter of fact, I was up at the California Association of Realtors Directors meetings up in Anaheim last week. And I was in the concierge lounge and a lady came up to me and I looked at her name tag and I recognized it. And I've known this lady online since 1995. Wow. 95. And she wanted to just come up and introduce herself. And I said, well, you don't need to introduce yourself. I wish you happy birthday so many times. It's embarrassing. (laughs) Here right. So, um, yeah, I'm a, I've been a real estate broker. I got licensed in California to sell real estate in 1975. I was a naval officer. I got out of the Navy here in San Diego. I went to high school here. My dad and mom settled here. So uh, I was aboard ship, got out. I like this. I always loved the idea of real estate. And first chance I got it, I bought a house. And but first I got my license, 75. I got a broker's license in 77. Uh, opened my own real estate company in 1979. I worked for another company in between. I managed a residential real estate office that specialized in common interest subdivisions, condominiums, stock cooperatives, community apartments, uh, planned unit developments, uh, those sorts of things. Got active at my board of realtors in the late 80s. We call them a board. They call them associations now. I was president of the San Diego Association of Realtors in 1993. I was instrumental in, in helping to create a countywide lockbox system and then a countywide MLS in San Diego. In 1995, I got the opportunity to be the first realtor member of the team uh, at, a, at uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of the National Association of Realtors referred to as RIN, the Realtors Information Network, which was yeah. the parent of Realtor.com. So I was on the first Realtor.com team. I was a person that had to create the, I'll call it a pitch, but the value proposition for what the internet was, what the World (laughs) Wide Web was, what listings, how listings could go on the internet, how it benefited brokers, how having our list, right? So I was uh, very, very involved in that. And it sounds so obvious now, Saul, but I'm guessing when you were doing it, uh, was it like pie in the sky? And that's a really interesting well, uh, project. It was, it, I was very, see, we all had this fear. We realtors in, uh, in the seventies, eighties and nineties, the primary point in their value proposition was they were new where, where all the properties that were for sale were located. Nobody else knew that. That was a, that was a trade secret. And we had this book and it said confidential. You can't give it away. There was no access online. So the idea, uh, and I was there when we got the first computer terminals in our offices and we had to use telephone lines to hook up the computers to the MLS database. So the idea of publicly exposing your listings 
to the world was a foreign idea. And it wasn't something readily accepted. And I was lucky to be the person that got to create the value proposition. And there was nothing out there. We, I had to go look, well, who's using this World Wide Web? Well, it looked like automotive dealers were using it. And the movie theaters were using it to say, come see our movies. You could click, you could then see all the different uh, information about the movies. And I would use those examples to kind of create, well, this is what's going to happen in the world of real estate. And uh, put, and we used black and white acetate overheads. You know, ever seen an overhead projector? <laughs> what and what used that? these and went out and made the case. And I was very lucky. The people that I talked to were receptive. The first place in the country for listings to go up on the internet on Realtor.com uh, was San Diego. That's a long story. But I was the president in San Diego in '93. So, uh, but a long story how that happened. The next place, really the place that agreed to the price to put your listings on the internet on Realtor.com was Austin, Texas. Wow. A dollar a listing a month. Think about this. Would you pay a dollar a listing a month today to have your listings and get all the leads from your probably listing? Probably would. Right? I probably <laughs> in Miami. Miami yeah. was the third uh, site. And then from there, we expanded and we built Realtor.com. And that's a whole nother story. When yeah. you've got some time, I'll tell you we, how we, that we actually, actually spun off. We have, to do another, we have to do another session because I think that story is very misunderstood, right? And not the, known. The, uh, unknown. And the people that know it, I think they get it wrong because they just know that Realtor.com was at some point associated with NAR and the MLSs and they and that was somehow botched and that Zillow came and took over, right? So I, I know there's a lot of, I've heard the stories, they don't seem believable, but I'd love to talk to you about that and kind of clarify that story. But let, let's jump ahead to the to the issue we have today, which is, okay, you were, so, so Saul, you were like part of uh, the generation that created a lot of these structures, right? You created uh, uh, your, 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 your instrumental creating your MLS board or expanding your MLS board to cover that area, and now we have the you know these these lawsuits coming. How do you how would you describe the lawsuits to someone that like a layperson not really familiar? You know they're a real estate agent, but they're not an expert. They're not a lawyer, and more than than not a lawyer, they're not they don't have a lot of expertise in these. They just assume these structures have always been there. The, the, yes. the MLS associations and the MLSs and the cooperation principles. So how do you explain it to a layperson what these lawsuits are about? Well, so first, let's just talk about what are the how many of these lawsuits are there <laughs> and what type of lawsuits. And this is very important. So first of all, there are civil lawsuits and there are three big civil lawsuits, uh, Moeller and Sitzer and No Select. So three civil lawsuits. And then there is a lawsuit with the National Association of Realtors and the Department of Justice, Got right? Got now, the National Association of Realtors named in all of them, but there, there's a big one, which is the United States of America versus, versus the National America. Association of Realtors. That's a big one. Then there are these other three big ones there, but they're civil lawsuits, right? That means it's people against NAR and against MLSs and against brokerage firms. Okay. And so the civil lawsuits are all pretty much the same. But remember, the where how we got to these civil lawsuits is not where we began. But I'll start with these civil lawsuits. Yeah. So we've got sellers who found big time attorneys like the tobacco, the attorneys that attack the tobacco industry, right? I mean, it's okay. big attorneys to make their case. And their case as sellers is... And there have been some settlements. Uh, their case is that the rules of the multiple listing service violate antitrust law and that they force buyers and they force sellers into a scenario in which and now people will argue in the industry, but I don't care what they, they say, because we have to look at what the cases are. And we can all argue till the cows come home, right? But this is these are the cases where the sellers are suing, the plaintiffs, and they're suing in the big case, Moeller. Uh, they're suing the major multiple listing services in the country, like 20 multiple listing services. And they're suing Keller Williams, Remax, Anywhere, uh, Home Services of America. So the big franchises and the National Association of Realtors. And the, they're, what they're saying is, 
We, the MLS is built on something called a unilateral offer of compensation. What that means is if I am a member of the MLS and you're a member of the MLS and you take a listing, I'm guaranteed if I bring you, or pretty close to it, if I bring you a buyer and that transaction consummates, I'm going to get paid. I don't need to have a contract with the buyer. I know that you've got a contract with the seller that says you're going to get paid and you join the club, you join the MLS and I join the club, I join the MLS and a stipulation of our joining, we don't want to call it membership, but it's joining is that if I take a listing and you bring a buyer, I'm going to share commission with you and vice versa. So now that means we only need one contract, a contract with the seller to ensure compensation. So what the plaintiff seller's are saying in this litigation in the three civil suits. And civil suits is dramatic because if you're found guilty of antitrust in a, in a civil uh, litigation, triple damages. All right. right. So that, that big time damages, triple damages. Right. And so they're saying, hey, you know what? If I had known, and then the realtors will say, well, you know, you were told, forget what you think. The sellers and the plaintiffs are saying, if I had known, I never would have offered a commission to the agent that brings in the buyer. Why would I do that? I wasn't informed. I mean, you can say you told me, but I didn't really understand that. And so I was right. forced into, and as a matter of fact, forced into paying much more than I would. Maybe if I'd have known, I'd have said, oh, okay, pay the agent that represents the buyer something. But hey, this is a hot market. You stick your sign in the ground, you get 100 offers, $100,000 over the offer price. People are waiving inspections. Why should I pay somebody who represents the buyer? They don't represent me. They represent the buyer. So you know what? If I'd have known that, I'd have never paid them. I'm suing. And so this law firm took this on, and there's a number of cases, right? There's these three big cases. There will probably be many others. And so far, we've had um, anywhere which is Coal Bank, a big companies, right? Big yeah. franchise. Century they 21. Settled, oh, yeah. yeah, they they settled for 83.5 million. Wow. And and Remax settled for 55 million. Now remember, if they go to trial and they lose, they could end up paying triple damages. Yeah. So the the attorneys that represent these real estate companies must believe that they're getting the best deal they can get. Yeah. Regardless of what you or I might think, yeah. right? The people that are got the, you know, their, their money's on the line. They're making these big settlements. So where this goes from here is there's still other plaintiffs that, and defendants that might need to settle. This could end up being a multi-billion dollar litigation right. and damages. And that's why people are afraid of this in the industry. Now, what what will happen probably and they've already settled out, some of the big ones have settled, is that that offer of compensation will change in the MLS. And so at least there'll be some type of requirement for full disclosure, informed consent, where you make it crystal clear to the seller that if they don't want to pay a commission to the agent on the buy side, that they don't have to. Got it. Right. So that's the concept. So what? Well, how big of a deal is that? Well, that's a pretty big deal. If you <laughs> rely like on the MLS and you don't have a contract with the buyer to pay you. Yeah. Right. So you're you remember the MLS, you show the property. If there's no offer of compensation, there's only one other place you can get your compensation. That's going to be from the buyer. But if you don't have it in writing, remember in real estate, statute of frauds, most of the contracts in real estate have to be in writing. You don't have a written contract. And I'm not talking about agency disclosure. That, that's a disclosure. I'm talking about a contract, a listing. You a know, buyer listing. A buyer's contract. Matter of fact, in the, in the 90s, when they passed the agency disclosure law, and, and oh, we can go into that, and it seemed to me like it was time to get real estate agents to start to create and use buyer contracts. There's some good references, an old book by Charles Tatham, which is Secrets of a Lucrative Real Estate Career, Representing Buyers in Real Estate Transactions. I got this out. I had a, a partner in 1991. We created a 
cassettes. Oh, this cassettes. <laughs> right? You know what cassettes are? No, people don't even know what cassettes are. <laughs> right? <laughs> this, is a, this is how to list buyers because we saw it coming. Now, it took I 30 guess. years. <laughs> <laughs> you were ahead of the curve. So, so, so let's give people some context because that's a really important point, uh, Saul, because people kind of assume that buyer agency is the model that we use and it's always been there. And I, I want to make two points and let me know how if I'm on track with this. Buyer agency became a thing in the 90s. So it it, it had not existed, you know, decades or centuries before that, if you want to go that far. And another thing that's really important, it doesn't exist outside the US and Canada, which people kind of, you know, they can fail to realize that. Buyer agency, this uni universal offer of, of, of compensation is a very US thing, right? You, you, and, I, and I, you know, I, I've lived in, in Mexico, I've lived in other places, I have a brother that lives in the UK, I've got people around me, and I've bought, you know, me and my family have bought properties outside of the US. It is a completely different system. It's a completely different system. And I'm assuming it worked like it worked in the US in the 70s and 80s. It's cl probably closer to that than, than what it is now. So there was a change there. There was a change a major there. Change. Now you'd be surprised. So, so first of all, MLS is the envy of the world. A hundred percent. Envy of the as, world. As a consumer, as a consumer, not as an agent. Agents love that there's no MLSs, by the way. As a consumer, it, it it's a jungle out there. And I'm talking about first world countries like the UK, not, not just Mexico. The UK, the UK, the listing agents have all the power, right? They they control it, pocket listings. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Yeah. As a consumer, I am shocked that they have not adopted uh, this. It's unique to the US and Canada. I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly why that is, but it's only there. It's only there. Well, so there's a history to this. It began with the, the reason that you don't have MLSs in the rest of the world, which, by the way, that's one of my projects. I hope that I can change it before I'm uh, <laughs> as long as I'm able. But the reason you've got it is you've got exclusive listings. So that's the first thing that allows there to be an MLS. And in the rest of the world, exclusive listings are rare. So prior to exclusive listings in here and I say in North America, in the United States and Canada, uh, prior to exclusive listings, what you had were open listings and net listings. And so open listing is a listing to any broker. Hey, sell it, I'll pay you, right? So, and the other is a net listing. And this made everybody in real estate look really bad. A net listing is where I took a property, a listing on a property for a certain price. And then I'll take it, I get a, the opportunity, I'll list it for a hundred grand. And then I go out and try to find somebody who'll pay me 500 grand and I keep the difference, right? And so you really were speculating People who sold real estate were spec, and there was no license law. So in the turn of the in the 1900s, 1906, 1908, somewhere in there, people realized in real estate that an exclusive listing could bring competitors together, and so we could then share commissions with one another as long as we had the seller locked up. Got it. So we locked them up, and then we realized that if we shared, there was more opportunity from sharing than there was from hoarding. Hmm. And so we they, they first they formed exchange groups, the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges, and then the National Association of Realtors, which introduced a code of ethics and the exclusive listing concept. And you still needed a compensation vehicle, some way to share to share those commissions. So the compensation vehicle that was created and lasted until 1996 was a unilateral offer of sub-agency. Mm. And what that meant, if I took the listing and I put it in the MLS, you, if you had a buyer, you represented the seller as a sub-agent. So okay. everybody represented the seller, the seller and nobody told buyers because there were no disclosure laws. So everybody had a fiduciary duty to the seller. Buyer says, I'll offer 100,000. You say, where in the world is can you buy property for a hundred thousand? I'm just using that as an example, right? You, you take a list and you say the buyer says, I'll offer a hundred thousand, but I'll go to 125. Well, you know what? You have a fiduciary duty to the seller. Yeah, 100%. Because the MLS was constructed as a unilateral offer of sub agency. Now, in the late, in the, in the late 70s, 
It took about 12 years and we got disclosure because people said, this is not fair. Buyers don't know that they're not being represented. They're spilling sure. the beans. They're giving up all this information and they don't know that the person who they think represents them, represents the person on the other side and really could run to the other side and give them all that information. So Love agency it. disclosure laws were passed first in California and then it spread to the rest of the country. About 1986, they gave the state was you. This is interesting. The age, the agency disclosure laws in California. Where are you from? I'm from I grew up down the I-5 from you and TJ. So not okay. that far away. OK, so in California, unanimous, the state legislature <laughs> passed the So, you know, in California, like it's hard to get everybody to agree to anything. Yeah, very hard. Very hard. Hundred percent. Right. hundred percent. They passed the agency disclosure law. So now the agency disclosure law said if you sell real estate, you have to disclose to both buyer and seller who you represent. And, you, and there's three ways to do this. You can either represent the seller exclusively, the buyer exclusively, or you can represent both the buyer and the seller as a dual agent. Those were the choices. So now but remember, if you're a member of the MLS, who do you represent? The seller. Everybody represented the seller. But agents didn't really kind of really understand that. So now the agency disclosure law comes down. You get a buyer. They call you on an up. You get an up call on, and they say, hey, I want to look at this property. You take them out. You're going to say to them, hey, before we do anything serious, I have to disclose to you who I represent. And agents thought, well, since I'm working with the buyer, I must represent the buyer. So the agents said, I represent the buyer. They documented it, but they didn't represent the buyer they represented the seller. And so by in signing agency that, in a sub agency, because of the sub agency. So by signing the agency disclosure saying they represented the buyer, they were, they were misleading the buyer. That was an undisclosed dual agency. They could lose their license. They could have the, wow. the transaction taken apart. They could have the commissions pulled back. And so after the agency, it took about a couple of years for this to happen. The MLS, as an offer of sub-agency, had to change because if it didn't, agents- It was in conflict gonna, with the law. It was in conflict were, with the they, they were liable unless they adopted representing buyers, which my partner and I thought they should, but they didn't. Right? <laughs> it didn't happen, which I thought they, was amazing, right? But it didn't happen that way. They didn't do it because NAR, first in California, and then NAR, they changed the rules of MLS. And they said, we're going to change it. No longer does everybody represent the seller. We're going to make it so you don't represent the seller, but you can take money from the seller side. Because remember, compensation doesn't determine agency. Who pays you doesn't necessarily determine who you represent. What determines who you represent is who you say you represent. Got it. And so they changed the rules of the MLS. And this is like 96 to go from a unilateral offer of sub-agency to a unilateral offer of compensation. So this was really a step forward. This was a step up. We went from buyers not knowing, buyers maybe not being properly represented in a transaction to being, to understanding, to knowing, and this was a step up. So changing the MLS was a step forward. Fast forward 30 years <laughs> and a hot real estate market. Very hot. If you asked any seller, if you said, hey, you know what? As soon as I put the sign in the ground, we're going to get 100 offers. By the way, would you like to offer 3% to the person that brings in the offer? What do you think most sellers would have said? <laughs> no. No way. That's Why would I do that? A dollar, right? yeah. you're just, you just told me you're going to bring me all these offers? Why do I need to pay somebody who represents the other side in a track? Heck no. Go ahead, bring me offers. Right. So these plaintiffs sued. They said, you know what? Had we known, we would have never agreed to this. And that artificially held the commissions uh, higher than they should have been. And so that's the nature of these cases, these three civil cases. The case against NAR with the Department of Justice also revolves around this offer of compensation, buyers and sellers not really being informed of what their options are. And agents will all say, but I told them, 
oh, they signed it. Well, maybe, but maybe they didn't quite understand it. Yeah, and maybe they did, but they're just saying they didn't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> also possible. possible. Right. So, so, so we, we've got, so, so, you know, and, and some of the, we don't have a, a, a like a public uh, knowledge of what the settlements uh, entail. It's not public yet. But some of the comments are coming out saying what you just said. They're saying, you know what, they're they're going to change that, or they're going to end that that universal offer of, of compensation um, uh, to the buyer's agents. That's going to be taken off the table. Where do you think we go from here? Is it going to be pre nineteen ninety six again? Uh, is it going to be something different? It's not. It's going to be you know it, history repeats itself first as you know tragedy and then as farce, right? So where where are we are where are we in that scale? Yeah. Are we going to go back to pre nineteen ninety six or something new come? That's a great question, guys. It could. I mean, the sub agency model worked. I mean, it worked, 100%. right? And if I, you, I, I looked this up, there was eight hundred thousand members of NAR before yeah. nineteen ninety six. It wasn't yeah. like they all disappeared. Like I were, they seemed to be doing great. Yeah, uh, you know, back in the in the nineties, so it worked. Some agency worked, and it could work again. And buyers might say, people might say, you know, I don't care if I'm represented or not. I just want to buy the house. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty. I'll look after myself as long as you have to be honest and fair with me. Maybe I don't need to have a fiduciary duty. I mean, so it could go that way. I don't think it will, but it could. The other side that I think is most logical, and it's got some uh, obstacles in the way financing being one of them. But I think the way that makes the most sense is to have a contract on the buy side, just like you have on the sell side. And the buy side contract says, I'm going to take you out and show you property. And I might get compensation because the MLS still offers it, but they might offer zero. And if they offer zero, um, I still would like to get paid. So if you're loyal to me, buyer, and you sign this contract, I'm going to do everything I can to be compensated out of the transaction. But if I'm not, then you ob you obligate to pay me. And that would be a buyer broker agreement that indicates that. Now, people will say, well, that won't, the lenders won't finance that. And I say, believe me, the, the lender, people who have money to loan want to make loans. <laughs> and so they will figure out ways to structure however it works out yeah. so that people will be compensated in the transaction. So I think there's a good likelihood that it will go to buyer contracts. So I advise people to learn more about using buyer contracts. Take some classes, go down to your local association of realtors, your MLS. I know here in California, the California Association of Realtors has the greatest forms. They've got forms for representing buyers, learn uh, those forms, learn all of the different paragraphs, what they mean. So you can explain it to a buyer because the big, we know the big obstacle, Gus, huh? people say, well, if I ask the buyer to sign a contract and, and Gus doesn't, they're not going to want to deal with me. They're going to want to deal with the person where they don't have to sign a contract. Right. 100%. 100%. Or, or so my, the, 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 my, the most hated phrase in real estate for me is that Work with me it for free, right? Oh, I'm a buyer's terrible. agent. It is it doesn't cost you anything. And I'm like, I always thought that was the most disingenuous, uh, you know, uh the strangest way to sell yourself, right? Work with me, you don't have to pay me. Like, well, then <laughs> you don't really work for it. that. Was the first question that I would come up. I heard that. Then who do you work for if you if and I'm not paying you? Because it's not me. I, I would assume that, right? So, so yeah, if people rely on that phrase, and there's a lot of agents that do. You got to do a 180 and go back and say, you know, this is what it costs. And so I remember in my market, where I worked in the Seattle market for a really long time, 10 years, the big real estate teams, the, 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 I'll be honest, the best run real estate teams, the largest real estate teams, they all operated this way. They had buyer listing agreements. And if they, and if they didn't get paid, they were going to get paid. 3% no matter what, <laughs> you know, like either from the seller or from you. Very competitive market. You know, sometimes they got off at 2%, 2 half. The buyer had to make them whole, right? And if they didn't want it that, thank you so much. You're not going to work with us, right? Because we are the, you know, we're, we're the gorilla in the room in some of these markets. So I, I, you know, I always thought that was a well, a good way to run a team. I always thought that was a pretty, you know, now it's going to be how everyone runs these teams if, if this, universal offer of compensation goes away. I, mean, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I don't think so. But so I have a question for you. W one thing I haven't been able to reconcile 100% because I, I was with Keller Williams for a long time. And I remember that there's this, there was this one case and I'm trying to remember where it was. I think it was a, 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 an MLS in Iowa. One, one part of the, I think it was part of Iowa where 
you know, the, the dominant uh, brokerage in that area didn't want to compensate buyer's agents. Or, but they said, hey, they're offering, their, their cooperation was a dollar. They would offer them a dollar and they were trying to maintain their market share with that practice. And there was a whole lawsuit around it. But they asked us agents, hey, contribute to like the Iowa Victory Fund because Keller Williams agents are only making a buck off of these deals. Let's help them out, you know, so on and so forth. Was that still so? So when I heard that, you know, when I when I first heard about this lawsuit about hey the buyer comes in, I said, well, is that really accurate? Because at least in this case, it was perfectly fine for the listing agent to offer a dollar to the to the buyer's agent. So is that is that just a weird case that happened in one MLS? No, there actually or, is. There was a, a Rex, I think. There actually has been Rex, cases, yeah. right? And, and so let's go back. The offer yeah. of compensation. Can't be a certain amount because that's antitrust. I got you. I got right? you. So got the you. offer of compensation rule was you must offer compensation. The whatever amount the market is, will bear. Whatever <laughs> the amount is. Well, what agents would say to a seller when they counsel them is here, I'm going to charge X percent. Well, for the purpose of example, we'll use six. I'm going to charge six percent. And I but know this: if other agents are gonna, if you want other agents to show it. We have to offer them something because if we don't offer them anything, there's a good chance they might not show it. Who wants to work for free? And so sellers would say, well, that's reasonable in a normal, that's reasonable. So how much are you going to offer them? Well, I'm going to be very big hearted and I'm going to offer them half. I'll give them half. You see, I'm not greedy. I'm going to give them half and I'm going to keep half, right? So that's the way it evolved. There was nothing written about the amount. It was just that you had to make an offer of compensation, but the marketplace kind of set this standard at what it turned out to, and that's part of the rub here. So when the market got really good, people came back and said, hey, there's nothing that says we have to offer half. We could offer less than that. And in this hot market, it's going to sell anyway. So let's not offer. And let's say to the seller, hey, you know, these other guys, they all want 6%. I'll do it for 3% and a, plus a dollar. Got it. Got it. And then they offer a dollar in compensation. Now, if you're representing a buyer, if you're out there and you've got a buyer, do you really want to work for a dollar? Yeah. And you know what? If you present the offer and you don't have a contract with the buyer, you're working for a dollar. Yeah. Now, Basically. one of these changes from these lawsuits is going to be that zero is a number. Got it. And so now, no, no longer does it even have to be a dollar. A dollar. Got it. It can be it. zero. Understood. So, right. so with, with the with the the rules that are currently in place, a dollar was an option. It's not that it was prohibited to be a dollar. That was never the case. It was oh, it's been an offer option. compensation, you know, and a dollar is compensation. But with if these changes go through, zero will be an option. Zero, zero will be an option. Which is, people whatever. say, well, a dollar and zero. What's the difference? I know, okay. but nonetheless. Everybody kind of understood that because you made it a dollar that you had to offer something. Now your offer, can, you can make the offer of compensation can be zero. Got it. Right. Got it. That's Understood. the way the rules are being interpreted. Now, here's something else people don't know. MLS is typically there's the way that you, MLSs are structured. They're either owned by an association of realtors or they're owned by brokers or privately owned or they're regional owned by a number of of associations. Those associ those MLSs that elect to follow the MLS rules promulgated by the National Association of Realtors get the errors and omission insurance from the National Association of Realtors. Mm -hmm. And so if that MLS is sued, there's insurance and, right. and, and antitrust lawsuits can be big money. And so why say, why do people follow? Why does NAR? Well, NAR has got the, NAR doesn't, see, NAR doesn't own any MLSs. NAR does not tell MLSs how to operate. NAR says, if you want our errors and omission insurance, here's all the, here's the standards of practice. Here's the way you have to function. And then our insurance carrier will cover you. Interesting. Right. And that's why people follow the NAR rules. And right. so the NAR rule was offer of subagency. It changed to, and it's the MLS member. You can go to the National Association of Realtors site if you're a, a realtor and you can download the MLS guidelines and read. Right. And some of the guidelines are mandatory. Some are optional. 
It depends on the MLS. And so this big rule, this big, out of this book, out of this, these guidelines, the thing that's being challenged in this litigation is the offer of compensation, the broker offer of compensation. They kind of honed in and said, that one's the one we can win. You know, because I'm sure they disagree with more than just that one. We're saying this is the one we could probably stack up. And it's the one that, and it's the one that has to do with money. Got it. Yeah, 100. percent And and so you know, do you do you think that as a result, uh, again, the settlements aren't public. We don't know what, how many, or if any more rules are going to change. What happens to the MLSs? Our concept of MLS does that change at all as a result of this, or or just that one rule? Yeah, some people say no, it won't change. Look what we did at Northwest MLS. You know, we offered a dollar. We've been offering zero for years, and it didn't change. But um, what what has to happen is people have to rethink the value proposition. I believe that even even with the um, offer of compensation going away there's value in the MLS. It keeps the data clean. It makes it creates a market. It makes sure that because there are rules, it makes sure that when uh, I look and find a listing in the MLS that it's actually available, it didn't expire. And you get this in Europe and other countries, right? Where Everywhere. it's not it's not available and people are using right. expired listings as bait to yeah. lure buyers. Yeah. And so there's huge value in an MLS, aside from the offer of compensation, it creates a marketplace, it creates an inventory, it gives people a place to begin to have the conversation to negotiate. And so I see the MLS continuing as a major component. So, well, we got Zillow, we got Realtor.com. Where do you think they get their data? <laughs> yeah. They get it from MLSs, right? Why? Because it's the cleanest data. Why? Because if you have a listing and it sells, you have to report that it's sold because if you don't, you get fined. Yeah. And so there's a reason that this data is the best. It's the, you know, it's the golden record. It's the best data on available properties. And then it builds a database of sold properties. And then all the people that participate, if they're realtors, are bound by a code of ethics. A lot of people scoff at that, but I still think it's valuable to know something about the people you're doing business with. Yeah. And so I believe that there is a continued value and use for MLS. And I think the rest of the world would still like to have it. And I think this, the Everywhere. turn has to be towards, see, before all you needed to guarantee compensation was a contract with a seller and up uh, in an MLS. You didn't need to get a contract with the buyer. You need one contract. What, what we'll probably see in the future, and it makes sense, is you'll need two contracts. You'll need a contract with the seller. You'll need a contract with the buyer. And the MLS will facilitate the exchange of information. I, I totally to, to understand that. And, that, and, that, and, you know, and some teams were already doing this. Uh, the, only the really elite teams that had a very good value proposition saw saw it as obvious like I, I, come on right but 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 the majority of the industry didn't I, I think it's moving I don't think I honestly it's all be, be real with you I don't think it's the worst thing ever to happen to real estate agents I, I honestly don't 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 think so uh you know if this is where things are going I think it's going to be important to understand what's happening and to adapt so so you know the, the, to wrap things up what should agents be doing you mentioned already be familiar with that buyer agency agreement, buyer listing, buyer contract. If you don't know what it is, find out what it is, incorporate it into your process, build that value proposition, stop using this. It's free if you work with me, which I always thought was kind of ridiculous. I as hate a value that. proposition. Never, people as didn't a value use that. Proposition. They didn't, years ago, people didn't say that. At least it was something that's kind of it popped up a, and it's disingenuous. It, it's not it honest, yeah. right? Don't use it. Hundred percent, Gus. Here's what I think. I think that you need to be able to describe what you do to whoever it is you want to sign a contract with you. And I always ask this question: Why would you hire you? If you could choose anybody who sells real estate in your geographic area, why would you hire you? Either on the buy side or the sell side, why would you hire you? Now, if the answer is I don't know. You got a lot of work to do. Yes, a hundred percent. Probably shouldn't be in commission only sales if you don't know exactly, you know, why someone should 
should hire you, right? hundred uh, percent. So a couple of rapid fire ones before we're done. Do you think these cases go to trial? Just, just as a as a betting man, you think uh, this, this, we're going to see a trial for any of these? Or well, so you, you... NAR says that they're not going to give in because they have a case. They believe that. They say that. And I'm a member of NAR. I have been for 47 years. And so I, if I go with what NAR is saying, I got to think they're going to take it to trial. However, I think it's a big risk. It is. I think you've already got a lot of attorneys for big real estate companies that pretty much have decided that it's not a slam dunk win if you go to trial and you're right. facing triple damages. And if you look at 83 million and you look at NAR, what if NAR loses and it's triple damages? Well, NAR is sitting on a reserve of 150 million. That's gone. Yeah. If these other companies, if they don't settle, that's gone. So I'm... I'm kind of reluctant to think that there's it's going to go to trial that, you know, it, it could first step. And then even after it goes to trial initially, it could end up settling. Yeah. Oh, sure. hundred percent. hundred percent. Like it's a, it's a nego- maybe a negotiating tactic, you know, at, at that point. Right. So interesting. Saul, uh, this has been a joy. I love it. I love talking to someone that knows exactly what they're talking about and can provide some of that perspective. I'll, I'll take, you know, I'll definitely take you up on that discussion about RIN which I think is a pivotal piece of real estate history, by the way. Like you, we, we live in that world every day right now. We take it for granted, but at some point that it wasn't for granted, right? It was actually, I'm sure it's a really interesting story how that went about. I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that sometime in the future. Uh, appreciate your time, Saul. You're a super busy guy. And folks, you know, Saul, if people want to continue the conversation, learn more about what you do and, and, what, and, and, and maybe ask you some questions, what is the best way for them to reach out to you if that's if that's available? Well, yeah. So I participate in uh, a number of groups on Facebook, uh, Lab Code Agents and Real Estate Mastermind. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. I also have okay. a website called The Data Advocate, thedataadvocate.com, because there, there are big changes headed this way and uh, that we all need to know about. You probably heard about the Black Knight acquisition by ICE, Intercontinental Exchange, the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange. Just purchased the company that owns Paragon, which is one of our MLS vendors. This is really big big news. So follow me on uh, thedataadvocate.com, or you can send an email. I love this. Saul at bettercallsaul.realtor. Saul at (laughs) bettercallsaul.realtor. Also Saul at saulkline.com, but it's easy to remember Saul at bettercallsaul.realtor. And I answer any question that you have. You send me an email. I'll get back to you. Awesome. Saul, appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yep. Good talking to you, Gus. Thank you.